When did summer become a thing of dread? This golden season for many parts of southern Europe has become one of fire and flame. And that's because rising temperatures make that fire always part of the rhythm of the Mediterranean year hotter and louder and deadlier. Southern Spain is one of the centres of that crisis, long known as the oven of Europe. Some here are now wondering how to cope when it becomes a furnace. Across Spain, summer after summer has been hotter and drier, with drought across the Iberian Peninsula and southern France ubiquitous. It's happening faster than climate scientists had dared dread. The evidence has been accumulating for years and it's quite clear and solid. You cannot deny something that is evident and is happening around you all the time. If you don't believe in climate change, just spend couple of weeks in summer in southern Spain, where temperatures are usually high, but now are extremes. Predictions are forecasting that we will probably um, increase in, for example, in the Mediterranean area, uh, region around the Mediterranean, the temperature will might increase around five degrees over the next uh, century. And that's a lot, because uh, that means that not only the average, but the extremes temperature are gonna be extreme as well. Perhaps if we are already over 40, 44 degrees, maybe it will be common to have a 50 degrees some days. And while 50 degrees may make human habitation nigh on impossible, or at least very difficult, it's already wreaking havoc on the natural world. This is Doniana National Park, one of Europe's most important wetlands. Doniana is twice the size of London, it's absolutely massive. And its landscape is punctuated by, dotted by these lagoons, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And as you can see, well, this one anyway is rather dry at the moment. Normally, this one would dry up in summer, but not this early. And then there are hundreds and hundreds of more which never dry up, which have done at some point over the last year because of drought and repeated drought. And the fact rainfall has been so much less than expected. In fact, by the time you got to last September, all of them, all of the lagoons have been dried up. So this wetland was no longer a wetland. And 60% of all of the lagoons of this place have been lost altogether. That is the extent of the change in the water available in Doniana. The last 10 years have had below average rainfall here. Climate change is driving that and humanity is making it worse still. Doniana is a good parable of our overall problem. Climate change itself caused by humans creates a problem, less water and humanity makes it in turn worse again because too much agriculture, too much fruit production has drained the aquifer, basically the water table, and diverts what little water there is away from the delicate wetland ecosystem. Poor regulation has led farmers to drill for water illegally with little action and now everybody loses because there's no water for the farms and the wetlands are dry. It's a textbook example of how not to respond to climate change and how to mismanage the environment. The WWF is now warning that this cherished and precious habitat is on the verge of collapse. Juan Romero is a local ecology campaigner and has watched the change up close. Ahora, los frutos rojos pues, están acabando con el paraíso de Doñana porque no se está haciendo de una manera ordenada. Son las aguas subterráneas y las aguas subterráneas son las que alimentan Doñana. Pues de aquí podemos tener una referencia de cómo están las aguas en Doñana, es decir, sobreexplotadas, es decir, no hay agua suficiente. So it's incredible stuff this. I mean, it's basically as far as the eye can see, they used to grow strawberries here. Um, and there are just fields and fields and fields for miles and miles and miles of this really creepy, disused agricultural land. Because as recently as two years ago, all of this was usable. It was fertile and irrigated. And now, within the last two years, as a result of drought after drought after drought going on for longer and longer and longer, it's just been abandoned. They built this over here as well, about five of them, to try and keep the land alive. And even that, and it's so deep, it must be about 20 feet deep, even that has now run dry. And you don't have to go far to see another crisis interact with the climate one. Just behind these disused, abandoned polytunnels there, those shacks, those huts held together by a bit of plastic and a bit of sticky tape basically are well, schools and schools of illegal migrants from North Africa uh, and they're brought over here to work this land except now 
as a result of the drought, as a result of the fact there hasn't been enough rain basically for over a year, nearly two years, a lot of this land is no longer workable. So they're stuck and they have nowhere else to go. So they're just going to basically, we're told, wait there until next season, hope the rain comes and they'll get work again. The illegal migrants here didn't want to be filmed, but we did speak to them on microphone for the news agent's podcast. Ahora cuando no hay fruto rojo, ahora de qué qué es lo que hacéis? Esperar que vengan para volver a cultivarlo o, o trasladáis a Almería o a Lérida o a otro sitio. Porque ahora no hay no hay trabajo. Que ahora mismo no hay trabajo. Pues que gente está aquí para para sufrir, para sufrir. Porque estamos aquí viviendo como así, pero no vale, no hay agua. Juan Romero, our guide, as you might imagine, is appalled by this negligence in every direction. Y el modelo que solamente tiene interés porque es rentable en la parte económica, mueve muchísimos millones, pero la parte social no está lo suficientemente cuidada y la parte ambiental es un desastre. No nos viven peor que los animales y tener garantizado un derecho fundamental que es el derecho al agua y aquí no lo tienen. It's not all bad news in Andalucía. On our drive back, we could see these extraordinary towers resplendent over the landscape, projecting luminous beams of light to the ground. They're light towers built in the last decade, capturing and reflecting the mighty Spanish sun at hundreds and hundreds of hungry solar panels below. Such is the power of these beams that they're enough to provide energy for a city the size of Seville not far away, in Extremadura, huge lithium mines are being opened, exploiting a massive natural resource that will help power Spain and the rest of Europe to electric vehicles. But with light comes heat, and with heat comes drought. And increasingly, in this country, like the rest of southern Europe, as the fires burn, many are asking how to live with what once seemed the best thing about these magical places, summer. In the British media, you often nonetheless still hear voices saying, oh look, places like Seville, places like southern Spain, they're always really hot. What do you say to that argument that parts of southern Europe, it's always hot, it's just summer? Yes, it, it's always hot. The problem is that as temperature fluctuates, then the, the probability to reach a extreme is, is high. But if the, the average increases, then the extremes are going to increase as well. So it's, it's usually hot here and warm during most part of the year. But now the, our exposure to very high temperature is more prevalent and is, is more frequent. So that's the problem that you are not killed by the average. You are killed by the extreme. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast.